Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of the Storage X Initiative. I would like to welcome everyone back to the Storage X Symposium. Uh, we took a short break uh, from, the, uh, from the end of June, and now we're ready to start our summer series for another um, exciting um, season. And together with uh, my colleague Itwe, we are delighted uh, to welcome our first speaker for the summer series. Over the past year, we have had the pleasure of hosting a number of our outstanding alumni uh, in the seminar series, starting with Stan Wintingham, and then J.B. Straubel, Andrew Ponick. And today, we're so pleased to welcome a fourth alumni uh, to our speaker uh, to our uh, Storage X Symposium series. Tim Holm, who is the CTO of QuantumScape, um, was a physics and mechanical engineering student many years ago at Stanford. And for the past decade, he has been working tremendously hard to realize solid state battery technology. It is a great honor for us to host him today and then to kick off the summer series. Uh, let me invite E to also say a few remarks as well. Well, thank you, Will. Um, I would like to also add my welcome to everybody to come back to our summer series around the world. Um, certainly welcome back virtually team. Uh, I still remember uh, meeting you while you were a student in uh, Professor Fritz Prince uh, lab, you know, working hard on a new concept of energy storage, winning the RPE proposal. I'm so glad to see since then that really turned into a really exciting journey uh, leading to formation of QuantumScape, you as a co-founder and CTO, um, and taking into a direction of solid state batteries. Certainly we have seen uh, in the past year also of the uh, commercial uh, activity in the uh, public market space, how exciting that is. Everybody talk about it. Uh, today is a great honor to have you coming back virtually to uh, share with us uh, the greatest and latest. Uh, with that, uh, team, I will pass the podium to you and uh, welcome back. Great. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It is an honor. It's been a great way to start Friday mornings uh, by watching this symposium. So it's nice to be able to come here and share what I've been up to and come back to campus, at least virtually. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking today about the status of QuantumScape's development of solid state batteries with lithium metal anodes. And I'll just start off with a few words about the company for those of you who aren't so familiar with QuantumScape. So we were founded in 2010. Uh, we've been around for more than 10 years. Uh, as many of you on the call will appreciate, <laughs> developing new battery technology is very difficult. So it's taken us over $300 million and uh, we have over 400 employees at this point in over 10 years. So it, it's been a long journey. Um, we're, we're certainly not done yet. Um, up till this point, we've, we've generated a lot of IP along the way. We have over 200 patents and applications, as well as a lot of trade secrets. And then just one other uh, highlight about the company is, I think one of the things that's, that's really enabled us to get to this point is a deep partnership we've had with Volkswagen since uh, 2012 or so. They've been really, really key, not just in funding, but also in supporting us as we uh, develop the technology. Um, you know, there have been, a, I think there are a few categories of customers we could have. There, there are some who say, you know, it's an interesting product, but maybe not for us. There might be others who would say, wow, that's, that's a really fascinating idea for a, a battery. You know, come to us when the development is done and, and we'd like to test it. And then there are others uh, like Volkswagen who have said, that's, that's really so interesting, so compelling that we wanna help you bring this to market. How can we help? So it's been great to have their, their partnership over time. Um, we've got a, a very strong management team. I'll just say a, a few words about some folks. Um, I, not only am I an alumni, but my other co-founders, 
uh, Professor Fritz Prinz and Jagdeep Singh are also alumni of Stanford. Um, and then, you know, it's a really strong team all around. I'll just highlight two other recent additions. Um, as we scale towards pilot land and manufacturing, we are starting to grow the manufacturing team. So we've, we've added some more talent from the semiconductor and battery industry. And uh, Selena will be familiar to some of you on this audience because she talked uh, several months ago when she was in her capacity at, at Panasonic, she's now joined us. So let's talk a little bit about the problem that we set out to solve at QuantumScape. It was really to, to help the transition of the car fleet to an automotive uh, electric vehicle car fleet. So there are about 100 million vehicles sold in the world every year. And still to this day, only a small fraction, about 3% of them are plug-in hybrids or fully electric cars. So it was our ambition to make not just an incrementally better battery that could help address this small fraction of the early adopter market, but to really close the gap between lithium ion batteries and combustion engine cars and enable electrification to take over in, in the mass market. And so to do that, we believe that batteries need to improve on five metrics that are important to consumers and, and drivers of cars. First is in the range of the car. You know, we've all heard about range anxiety. So we think that certainly in the US, you need to get to 300 mile range or so to be compelling. Uh, and that requires a battery with higher energy density. Fast charging. So there'll be some consumers who, you know, can, can charge their car in their garage overnight and don't need fast charge. But then to get past those early adopters to the whole market, you need to address the people who go, expect to go on road trips on the weekends and need fast charge to go on longer road trips or who don't live in a house with access to a charging station in their garage. Maybe they live in an apartment building or something like that. Um, so fast charge to, to close the gap to how fast it is to refill with gasoline, I think is a requirement. In terms of cost, the single biggest line item of the, the cost of an electric vehicle is the battery itself. And so if you're gonna get to the mass market price point of low cost cars, you need low cost batteries as well. In terms of lifetime, the battery should last the life of the car, which is you know, 12, 15 years, lots of miles as well. And then in terms of safety, uh, you'd like to take at least no steps backwards relative to lithium ion and hopefully improve safety there as well. Now, of course, the energy source that is required to drive a car means you're gonna store a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to drive a car. So there's always a risk of that energy getting released in, in certain ways but you would like it, like it to be as safe as possible given that, uh, that, given that you have to store a lot of energy. So these are really the five key metrics that we set out to try and improve on. And in, in batteries, one thing that's very hard is balancing these metrics. They'll all sort of trade off against each other. So one concrete example is energy and power, right? You can make an energy cell with thick electrodes that has lower power, or you could make those electrodes thinner and get more power at the expense of energy. Uh, so that's just one trade-off, but many of these metrics trade off against each other. And so one of the things that's very hard in batteries is to improve on all metrics simultaneously. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we're, we're attempting to do that. So I think you all will be familiar with lithium ion batteries. This is a schematic on the left showing the, end, the graphite or graphite and silicon anode, the porous separator, the, the cathode material like a lithium cobalt oxide or an NMC, for example. And then the current collectors uh, that carry heat and electrons out of the cell. What, what I'd like to highlight, even for those of you familiar with batteries, is how much the anode is responsible for some of the, these limitations along the five key metrics that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of energy, well, as, as you can see from this graphic, which is drawn roughly to scale, you know, the anode is consuming quite a lot of space and therefore mass in the cell. And in terms of fast charge, well, especially at low temperatures, but even at, at modest or room temperature, one of the limitations to be able to charge the battery quickly is the distance that lithium ions have to travel through this liquid electrolyte to get throughout the anode and then to diffuse into the graphite particles. And then, you know, one of the risks in fast charge, especially as you get towards higher states of charge, is that as the graphite particles get near full, the lithium could start to plate on the outside of the graphite particle rather than intercalate inside the particle itself. And so when that lithium plates on the outside, that damages the life of the cell in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, when, 
it, it'll hurt the coulombic efficiency because some of that lithium will react with the liquid electrolyte to form the SEI uh, layer. And second, because you could actually form dendrites where lithium would grow in these mossy or dendritic structures, uh, penetrate through the separator and bridge to the cathode, and at which point the battery fails. So the anode is also responsible for some of the fast charge limitations. In terms of cost, well, it, you know, it costs money to buy the active materials and to deposit them. And then also in the formation cycle, um, you know, what, what's called this formation process, what you're forming predominantly is the anode SEI, the solid electrolyte interface that forms on the surface of the graphite particles. And this formation and aging process is one of the most cost intensive parts of battery manufacturing. It can take weeks to form and, and age the battery. These are weeks after the battery is made when it's in its highest value state uh, that you have to, as a battery manufacturer, just carry as inventory on your shelves and, and run through cyclers to test them. So it does contribute to cost as well. In terms of lifetime, it turns out one of the main sources of capacity fade in a battery, one of the main reasons why your phone doesn't last as long today as when you bought it. <laughs> Sorry, I have my, my two-year-old in the background here. Um, one of the main reasons that battery capacity fades is this SEI growth uh, continues as the battery ages. And each cycle, as the graphite expands and contracts, this SEI can crack and then regrow, which consumes electrolyte and lithium from the cell. And then in terms of safety, well, the, this liquid electrolyte and the polymer separator and the graphite material are all flammable components. So they all store energy that isn't useful energy that can be used to drive the car, but store energy that could be released in the form of a fire if, if the car gets in a crash. So really, the anode contributes to all five of these metrics uh, that, that would be important. So then this uh, chart is one adapted from a study that BMW did, did several years ago, where they were looking at next generation chemistries and what is their potential in terms of cell energy density, watt hours per kilogram on the y-axis here. So they looked at more conventional cathode materials like nickel-rich NMC and NCA and across a spectrum of what, what they thought were the most promising next generation cathode materials and sort of modeled out the energy density that you can get with any of these cathode materials. What you can see is that if you use the graphite anode, you can get into the 200s of watt hours per kilogram. Um, and then as you start to include more and more silicon in the anodes, you can nudge that up into the 300s, uh, depending on how much silicon you use in the anode. But when you get to lithium metal and you really remove all of the host material from the anode, you can unlock quite impressive energy densities. This is sort of one of the key insights that, that we had as well. Try and, try and go to lithium metal anodes and address the, these key challenges. And you know, I, I, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me that I'm not saying that we invented the lithium metal anode. It's just that um, this is the mission that we set for ourselves. Let's try and make it possible and safe and, and commercialize it. So this then shows the lithium ion architecture in comparison with the, the quantum scape architecture that we have, where we have what we call an anode free design. So there's no anode in the as manufactured state. We have a separator that interfaces to a current collector and, and nothing present in the anode side. The cathode is relatively similar, both the, the active materials and, and ion conductors or catholite inside the cathode uh, share a lot in common with lithium ion batteries but we've replaced the anode with, with nothing in the manufactured state. And then all the lithium that's in the cathode material as manufactured will on the first charge come and plate at this interface between this separator and the current collector and form this block of lithium metal at the anode side. And then this is the lithium that cycles back and forth as you charge and discharge the cell. Uh, so one of the keys here to enabling this architecture is the, the separator. So we replaced the porous polymer separator with a dense ceramic separator here um, that sits between the anode and cathode. And it's this separator that's, that's a key, I think, to enabling lithium metal, as we'll talk about. So what, what does this change enable in terms of energy density? So this is a map then of um, mass specific energy density or watt hours per kilogram on the y-axis and volumetric energy density on the x-axis showing the range of commercialized chemistries from 
lithium ion phosphate or LFP chemistries, which are low energy density, but low cost to what's more common in electric vehicles, at least uh, the ones outside of China using an NMC or, or as Tesla uses NCA uh, cathodes. So these uh, batteries are going to improve by, you know, we're projecting several percent per year as you go to more nickel rich cathode chemistries and include more silicon on the anode. But what we're hoping to enable is really a, a pretty impressive change relative to what's, what's typical in batteries of you know, single digit percent per year improvements in energy density uh, by switching to this lithium metal architecture. So that's the target uh, in terms of energy density. By removing the host material, we, we hope to improve on energy. By eliminating this lithium diffusion bottleneck that I talked about, we hope to enable fast charge. By eliminating this SEI formation and growth, uh, we hope to improve in life. By eliminating the, a lot of the flammable materials in the cell, we hope to improve in safety. And a further benefit in safety is, it, you know, if the car gets in a crash or has some over temperature event, the polymer separator can melt. And then it, as it peels back, it, it'll expose more contact area between the anode and the cathode. And that contact area can result in internal short circuits, which delivers a lot of energy to heat the battery very quickly. That is part of what can lead to this, this chain reaction or thermal runaway. So this is why that most modern separators today will start to include a layer of, of some ceramic particles that are still porous. The, the, purpose of those ceramic particles is to try and prevent this thermal runaway by putting something that won't melt in between the anode and cathode. Well, our separator is this entirely dense ceramic material. So I think we, we achieve that effect, uh, hopefully to a greater extent. And then in terms of cost, as I've described, we eliminate the anode uh, manufacturing step and materials. So hopefully we can lower costs as well. So. This, this change, we hope to uh, address these five metrics simultaneously. Uh, now, as I said, we didn't invent the lithium metal anode. That concept has been around for decades, um, but it has been hard to commercialize. And this is why you don't see a lot of uh, cars today driving around with lithium metal anodes. So people have tried various different separator chemistries between organics and inorganics. There are many families of materials that have, have been attempted to work with lithium metal liquids, gels, solid polymers like PEO. Um, among inorganics, their sulfides and oxides are the most popular classes. Also emerging over the last few years are halides, uh, borohydrides. Unfortunately, all of the materials that have been tried uh, have real challenges on at least one, if not more of, this, of the key metrics for the separator. So when it comes to the separator, some of the key requirements, at least in the automotive space, are uh, it needs to have a high bulk conductivity competitive with liquid electrolytes. If you think about it, it's pretty impressive to have lithium hopping through a solid matrix as quickly as it'll transit through a liquid, uh, but it is possible in some materials. Then the interface to the anode needs to be as conductive as possible. One of the things that, that's a little bit subtle and, and sometimes underappreciated is that there can be as much resistance at just the interface between the lithium metal anode and the the separator as there is throughout the entire bulk of the separator. So to be able to have a high power battery uh, and, and enable fast charge, you need to have a low interfacial resistance. ASR is an area specific resistance. The separator is gonna be in contact with the anode and cathode over the life of the, the cell, and also in contact with both the, the zero volts relative to lithium on the anode side and the high voltage of the cathode side. So maintaining stability over that very wide range of activity of lithium. It's about 80 orders of magnitude of lithium activity when you go from zero to four volts. 80 orders of magnitude, is, you know, it's such a large number. It's, it's literally astronomical number. There's something like 10 to the 80 atoms in the, in the universe. So the 80 orders of magnitude of lithium activity, it's like saying you have, you know, metallic lithium on the anode side and 10 to the minus 80 uh, lithium activity on the cathode side would be one atom of lithium per atom in the universe. It's, it's just a huge range of lithium activity. So for a material to be stable across, across that full range is extremely challenging. And then of course, dendrite resistance is probably the, the biggest challenge here. So as described earlier, when lithium plates on the anode, 
it tends to form these dendritic structures that bridge across to the cathode and result in an internal short circuit. Uh, dendrites tend to form exponentially more aggressively as you increase the current density during charge. So as you go to a, a fast charge requirement, it becomes very difficult. And I'm not aware of any really compelling demonstration that, that a cell can resist dendrites over many cycles and, and realistic automotive conditions. So that, that's a big challenge. Uh, then finally, the separator has to be made thin, comparable to today's uh, polymer separators, process it continuously, not in batch modes or, or high vacuum processing to enable low cost over large areas. So it's really a, a difficult challenge. And if you're not able to, to meet that challenge, well, there are a couple of, of sort of fallback positions or compromises, either to revert to a hosted anode and use carbon or a carbon silicon anode again, or use excess lithium, at which point you're really diluting the advantage that a solid state battery can have relative to lithium ion in terms of energy density and cost. Or you, you might have to compromise the test conditions and sacrifice some of the real world operating conditions that automotive uh, market expects to go to either slow charge rates or thin cathodes, low cycle life, uh, or limited temperature range, and for example, run hot only. And so these are sort of the, um, the compromises one might have to make if, if one doesn't have a separator that can meet all of the requirements on the last slide. So that's sort of the, the landscape. Now I'll talk in more detail about QuantumScape status and, and really go into the data of, of where we're at right now in, in solving all of these monumental challenges. So on the left is a photo of our separator. Uh, it's roughly the size of a, a smartphone. It's shown here, it's quite flexible. That flexibility is not required in operation. It'll be just flat in a cell, like what's shown in the middle, but it does speak a little bit to its robustness when it's thin. You know, for those of you who are familiar with handling thin silicon wafers, uh, even a silicon wafer can get quite flexible as it's thin. So it's pretty impressive what, what thin films can do. And this is an image of our single layer pouch cells, again, roughly the size of a, a, a phone, and then image of our multi-layer prototype cells over here on the right that, that we're, we've been developing over the last year. Uh, so let's start off getting into some of the data. This is a cycling data from, a single layer, from batches of our single layer pouch cells in this form factor. And it is, I think, one of the most impressive demonstrations of, of dendrite resistance that our cell uh, offers. So I'm showing the, the discharge energy on the y-axis and cycles on the x-axis here. The commercial uh, target that Volkswagen has set for us and that we're setting for ourselves is 800 cycles to 80% fade. For context, a uh, typical EV warranty today would be somewhere in the between 100 and 150,000 miles to 70%, so somewhere where my cursor is right here. Uh, we're trying to get to, to this 800 cycles to 80% target here. Why 800 cycles? If you have a long range electric car of say 300 miles, then if each cycle is 300 mile range, then 800 cycles give you 240,000 miles. That's, that's pretty considerable um, to 80% fade. And so then this is showing batches of our cell performance here going out to over a thousand cycles, um, cycling quite well under conditions that are listed in this table here. So we're also trying to be transparent about the test conditions for, for every test. And so we'll give you the test conditions here. This is at a 1C, 1C rate. So one hour charge, one hour discharge. That's pretty aggressive for a cycle life test like this that's typically done at C by three, meaning three hour charge. So this is three times higher current density on every charge. The cathode loading of, of north of three milliamp hours per square centimeter is getting thick enough to, to have real energy in the cell. The temperature of 30 degrees is near room temperature. Uh, we're using the anode-free lithium metal anode configuration that I've described going full depth of discharge over the, the full uh, commercially relevant areas. Pressure is something I'll talk more about in a minute, um, but we're uh, these, these tests are done under relatively modest pressure on single layer cells. So I think this was a, a pretty exciting proof that the, the materials and the processes that we use to make these materials are really capable of withstanding real world conditions or even more aggressive than real world conditions here. So then fast charge is you know, another really key requirement we think. So how do our cells do in fast charge? 
So this is uh, in blue here is data that we collected on, on cells in our lab showing fast charge capability. So the y-axis is the state of charge over time on the x-axis. So we did here a, a 4C charge rate, and you can see the cell charging up quite quickly. It beats this target we have set for ourselves of 80% in 15 minutes. What's shown in gray here is, is data that, that we didn't take in our lab, but um, we, we found that was published on you know, a leading automotive cell hooked up to a supercharger that in 15 minutes gets to about 50%. And then the, the charge rate really has to taper off after then to avoid this problem that I spoke of earlier of lithium plating. So to get to 80% takes about 40 minutes in, in these type of cells. Uh, so this cell was, was again the same cell that I described on the last, last slide in terms of cathode loading, uh, temperature, anode uh, area, pressure, number of layers, and so forth. So it's the, the same cell that can do fast charge. Then we wanted to, to really test dendrite resistance of the separator itself. So we took the separator out, out of a cell and did a stress test where we just increased the current density and saw at, at what current density can, can the separator withstand. So we're, we're passing small amounts of lithium and then increasing the current density, pass more lithium and increase the current density and continue to increase the current density here. So many solid state efforts can, could do south of one milliamp hour, one milliamp per centimeter squared or, or up to about one milliamp per centimeter squared. To get to the 4C charge rates that I described earlier, that's you know, 12 to 16 milliamps per square centimeter, depending on cathode thickness. We went all the way to north of 100 milliamps per square centimeter uh, across the, the separator without failure. And so then this is showing the, the corresponding voltage that develops across this lithium-lithium cell. This test was done at 45 degrees because uh, that's really the condition probably most relevant to fast charge. I think most fast charges, the car will already be driving. And so the, the batteries will be somewhat warm and then they'll, they'll also heat up due to their internal resistance as you charge. So 45 degrees is, is a pretty relevant fast charge condition. Uh, we were doing this in a lithium-lithium configuration because a cathode really can't deliver this kind of current density. 100 milliamps per centimeter squared is, is just far north of what a cathode can sustain for, for long periods of time. So again, this, this is the materials level test. It's not inside a cell, but you can think of it just as a stress test to show a factor of safety above a real world operating condition. So this is, I, I thought, a, a pretty compelling demonstration of dendrite resistance. I'm not familiar with, with any other results that get uh, anywhere close to this, frankly. Uh, if, you know, I'm happy to be contradicted in the Q&A, please speak up if you, if you know of otherwise. So then we, we put the separators back into the, a cell and ran what I think is really the most stressful test that I've, I've seen done on our cells. This is a, a track cycle that we got from our automotive uh, customers. So to just describe this track cycle for a minute, this is showing one lap around the, the simulated track here. Um, so just to be clear, our batteries weren't actually in cars driving around the track. We just took this drive cycle and, and did it on our single layer pouch cells. So this shows current density over time of one lap around the track. Accelerations of four or five C here and regenerative braking of one or two C and then repeating this very uh, aggressive accelerations on the straightaway, braking going into the turns and repeat around one lap of, of the track. And then we repeat to get to about nine or 10 laps around the track until the battery is fully depleted. And then we go into a 4C fast charge. And then we just repeat that cycle of laps around the track until the battery is fully depleted and 4C fast charge. Do that continuously. And so then this graph shows two of our cells and how they perform on that test, um, showing pretty gradual fade for over 1200 laps around this, this, so this track. This, this test is quite uh, stringent. So if you put a leading energy cell that came from a, a leading automotive uh, on the same test, it fades, fades much more quickly um, just because this is a very aggressive test. And again, all the test conditions listed here, this was done on the, the same generations of cells that I've been describing in the, in the last few slides. So next, um, temperature performance. One of the knocks against a solid state battery is that they have to be hot to, 
to run, I think maybe that intuition might come from polymer cells that need to be heated to 60 or 80 degrees to have sufficient lithium ion conductivity. Um, so we wanted to show that our materials are capable of running across the full automotive temperature range down to minus 30 degrees C. So this just shows a single C by three discharge at decreasing temperatures from zero degrees down to minus 30 degrees C. Uh, in between each of these discharges, we would do a C by three charge at 30 degrees just to get the, the full charge capacity. So this is really just showing discharge capability of, of the material system. And for comparison, this is again uh, the same leading automotive cell here at minus 25 degrees, showing that it, it gets less capacity than our cells do at, at minus 30. So in, in the right solid state system, they can run across the full automotive temperature range. So then we wanted to show cycling at low temperatures. So this, this would be representative of sort of real world winter driving conditions. Um, minus 10 degrees C, charging at C by five and discharging at C by three repeatedly. Uh, so this is showing uh, performance of our cells you know, across winter, showing that they retain a lot of capacity. And then again, these were the, the same generation of cell, this single layer pouch cell, same cathode thickness, everything else. So I think solid state cells can work well at low temperature. This is, this is some encouraging evidence. Um, next, let me come back to this, this pressure point here. So many cells need some pressure, even lithium ion cells have some pressure to keep all the layers in contact with each other. And uh, as, they, as things swell and expand and contract as lithium moves in and out of the, the different layers. Uh, solid state cells are often tested at, at relatively higher pressures uh, to keep all the layers in contact with each other. The results that we've been using at, at about in the range of three atmospheres are, I think, a, an achievable pressure when you put it into a car. You know, the higher pressure you go to, the more volume and mass will be, in a sense, wasted at the pack level to apply that pressure. You're, you're going to need some you know, steel or, or, or material in the cell, in the module or in the pack to apply the pressure to a cell. Um, so we're, we're trying to enable low pressures. You know, the range of three atmospheres is something that we think might be doable with, with not too large of a penalty at the pack level. But we also wanted to show that the technology is capable of going to lower pressures. So here were some small cells that we put on just as a feasibility test, uh, showing cycling at, at 1C, 1C conditions, still relatively thick cathodes near room temperature with anode-free lithium metal, full depth of discharge. They, they, were, they were relatively small cells. We haven't baselined this in, a, in our large cells, um, but cycling at one atmosphere, absolute pressure, meaning these, these pouch cells were unfixtured, there was, there was nothing additional applying any pressure. They were just in a pouch cell that we evacuate. So you get ambient room pressure on the outside of the pouch cell. Uh, so one atmosphere, absolute pressure. And what you can see is that uh, these cells are all performing quite well, you know, cycling with gradual fade out to 1400 cycles, even under this, these 1C, 1C test conditions with zero pressure. So like I said, we haven't baselined this uh, low pressure performance on our larger area cells, but I think it is a pretty compelling uh, proof that the materials are capable. So this is something we'll be continuing to work on. Then next, um, one other demonstration that, that we just sort of threw on uh, to, to prove a point that our, our uh, separator and anode free lithium metal cell architecture is we could think of it kind of as a platform technology. It could enable many different cathodes. So all the results I've shown you up till now are using a nickel rich NMC material. We also wanted to show that lithium ion phosphate LFP could work in our system. So we made a, a four milliamp hour per square centimeter LFP cathode. That, that's a pretty thick LFP cathode. Uh, and just did sort of a hundred cycle compatibility test of a, a few cells here. Again, these were, were small cells small single layer cells, um, pouch cells that where the active materials are roughly the size of a coin cell, single layer cells, but it's just to prove materials compatibility and sort of show our customers, hey, if you want lower costs, lower energy density LFP, 
that technology works uh, as well and we can develop it. Our, our core focus really has been on the high energy density cell. So that's, that's what we're really focused on. But I think this is interesting, especially in recent weeks, as you've seen more and more automakers say that they're really looking at LFP. So um, Volkswagen has said that a lot of their fleet should use low nickel technologies to get to low cost. Uh, just recently, Elon Musk said, uh, I think it was last week, he said that as much as two thirds of their fleet might switch to LFP just to get to into the lower cost points. So if we're hearing more of that from our customers, then we could do more demonstration of LFP. The last point I'll make about LFP is because it's a lower voltage chemistry for the same uh, loading, it's gonna have a, a thicker cathode and therefore require a thicker anode. So when you are using a hosted anode, that anode will impose a larger penalty on LFP than it would on a high voltage material. So if you switch to our architecture of a lithium, lithium metal anode that's anode free, you get an even better, bigger benefit on LFP than you do on a high voltage cathode. So the energy density improvements that we hope to enable for NMC will, will be, you know, as a percentage basis, even larger on LFP. So that, that could be interesting. We'll see how this uh, plays out as we move forward. One point on safety here, uh, we wanted to show that our separator is stable against lithium. And so what we did is we, we put lithium in contact with our separator inside a, a DSC device, a differential scanning calorimeter, uh, basically a device that can measure heat flows in and out. So lithium in contact with our separator here, as, you, as we heat up, you see um, basically no little heat flow in or out of the system. When you get to 180 degrees C, that's where lithium melts. So you see a little bit of an endotherm here. That's the latent heat of melting lithium. And then as you continue to heat molten lithium in contact with our separator, there's no, no exothermic reaction that, that we see here. And then in contrast, if you do the same test of lithium in contact with a liquid electrolyte, when you get to the point where lithium melts, you'll see a large exothermic reaction. Uh, this is the reaction of lithium and a liquid electrolyte. That's, that's not surprising. But the contrast here, I think, shows that our separator is quite stable in contact with lithium. So this is, is going to be important from a safety point of view. Okay, so this has been, so far, I've, I've talked really about the fundamental materials that we uh, and materials level demonstrations that we've made on single layer cells. Of course, to, to commercialize the technology, we're going to need to make high energy cells, which means we need to multi-layer our cell. So now let's talk about the progress that we've made in the last year in, in multi-layering cells. So this is, again, the the schematic of a unit cell, a, a one layer cell. A, a two layer cell would be to take the cathode current collector and coat cathode on both sides. That's what's done in lithium ion today. And then put our separator on each side of that. And so that is then a two layer cell. And then a four layer cell would be to take two of these and stack them on top of each other. So a four layer cell is really the, the, the fundamental building block of, of further stacking, because here you have all of the interfaces that you'll have in, in an end layer cell. You have cathode to cathode here, and you have anode to anode here. So it's all of the, the key interfaces. So as you go towards dozens of layers, you, do, you would just replicate these four layer units and stack them on top of each other. So the four layer stack is, is really the, the unit that, that would demonstrate all of the functionality of further stacking on top of that. So we have made four layer cells and, and cycled them and shown that the cycling is consistent basically with the single layer cells. So the first four layer cells we were making were, were smaller areas. These were 30 by 30 millimeters. Uh, we tested these at C by three and one C rates, again with a similar cathode loading, near room temperature, same pressure, but four layer cells and showing that we can exceed this commercial target of 800 cycles to 80%. Uh, these, these cells were all exceeding that pretty comfortably. Uh, so this was, was an interesting early demonstration that, that multi-layering could work. Uh, again, these were done with smaller areas. Since then, we progressed to larger area multi-layer cells. So this is showing our latest cells that are still on test here. 
they're they're passing 450 cycles as we speak, uh, still going, retaining a lot of their capacity. Again, at 1C, 1C rates with same cathode loading, uh, room temperature, full depth of discharge, um, full, full commercially relevant area here, four layer of cells. So it shows that, that uh, there's nothing fundamentally impossible about doing multi-layering in our technology. And so then very recently, <clears throat> we went beyond four layers. The, the goal we had for ourselves was to, to prove for, that four layers could work and then go up to 10 layers by the end of the year. So we don't have the, the full 10 layer demonstrations yet, but just the very earliest 10 layer cells that we've put on test, uh, <clears throat> that we've, we've put on show that 10 layer cells uh, can work. I don't want to over conclude here. They're still very young, right? Only, only a few dozen cycles, but but still going strong here, under both one C and C by three conditions. So this is is very recent, right? These cells are cells are still on test and racking up cycles. So we'll see how they go, but it does show that we can get to to ten layers. Um, just one word on why multi layering has has taken us so long. Right, we showed some of these single layer results last December, and now here we are about seven months later showing very early 10 layer results. It's, it's basically a question of how much material we're able to make. So we took the approach of trying to, make, trying to prove that all the materials could meet the key automotive requirements before scaling up. I think that's sort of fundamentally the right approach. If you, if you prematurely scale up, well, then maybe you're going to still have to go back to the to square one and, and change materials or cell architecture. So we wanted to show that the materials and cell architecture could, was really capable of meeting the, the key automotive requirements before scaling up. So we, we had you know, small generations of the tools that could make enough material to, to make and test lots of single layer cells, right? To do development, you need to, to run a lot of experiments and then you need to also run a lot of statistics. You need to have large sample sizes to, to know your reliability. So we had the smaller tools that could make enough material for single layers. And then to go over to a 10 layer cell, you would need to either <clears throat> multiply your, your facility footprint by a factor of 10, you know, go from a 80,000 square foot facility like the one we have to an 800,000 square foot facility and get 10 of every tool that you have and hire 10 times as many employees as you currently have. Um, you, you would either do that if everything scales linearly, which of course is not what you want to do. You want to capture economies of scale. So the alternative you have <clears throat> is to buy much bigger, more, more scalable tools that, that capture economies of scale. But these bigger tools have very long lead times you know, that are not measured in weeks, they're measured in months or quarters. And then you need to install these tools, qualify a process on them. Uh, so that's, that's really what, why multi-layering takes, takes a while. Um, okay, so just to kind of wrap up the data section, I want to put our data in context of, of the other data that I'm familiar with from companies that are really seriously trying to commercialize solid state batteries. So this is a chart that is published on our website. I'm not going to go into every cell here because there's quite a lot of information, but if you're interested, you can go and take a look at it on our website. We're trying to just compile in one place the most serious solid state technology efforts. So Toyota, Prologium, and Solid Power are all working in solid state systems um, with a hosted anode material. Uh, for the most part, they haven't published cell data. Um, we'll see if Toyota still has a, a demonstration during the Tokyo Olympics like they've been promising. Uh, Prologium has said that, that their carbon anodes can get to 1300 cycles, but haven't published most of the other relevant uh, test conditions. So we'll, we'll see as they develop. Then uh, a couple of the key players working with solid state and lithium metal, ionic materials working on polymers. Samsung has published a paper last year on their sulfide technology and SES that's also recently coming out and, and announcing that they're gonna go public with a polymer and liquid hybrid cell and, and lithium metal. Um, so without going into to all the details and, and boring you, what I'll just point out is that uh, these technologies have either had to sacrifice in terms of cycle life in terms of uh, running at high temperature and pressure of 20 atmospheres and 60 degrees C or low current densities uh, of like C by five rates, which, which wouldn't enable fast charge. 
So uh, this is kind of the, the landscape um, of, of some of the most serious players out there. If I've missed anything or, or gotten anything wrong, I haven't heard it since we put out this chart several months ago. So certainly open to it in the Q&A if, if you know these players have, have published anything more recently. So I think uh, you know we've got a pretty compelling technology. Let's talk about how the, the road towards pilot and manufacturing will look. This is the sort of at a high level, the manufacturing flow of a lithium ion cell. You start with cathode materials and mix it into a slurry with the, the binder, conductive additive, and solvents. You mix it, you code the electrodes, you calendar them, uh, you slit them to size and dry them. <clears throat> then the anode, cathode, and separator that is typically purchased will all come together in either a stacking or winding step. There'll be then, then you go into the cell assembly, formation, and testing, and, and finally shipping the cell. So as I've been saying, our, our technology does away with this anode. So you could either um, convert your anode manufacturing line into a cathode line uh, and get twice the throughput of it, or if you're building a new factory, just not put in this, this whole anode manufacturing line and have a more capital efficient uh, factory that, that makes the cathode, buys the separator from us, assembles that into the cell. I haven't talked much about this, but we hope to substantially reduce this formation process because again, we're not forming the SEI on the anode. So uh, a lot of this formation process can hopefully be reduced. <clears throat> and this, this will hopefully it, it sort of illustrate why we, we hope to have a cost advantage relative to lithium ion battery. You can do away with, with a lot of the factory here. Then let's talk about the separator for a minute. Our separator materials use precursors that are abundant, uh, low cost, and used in other industries. So we're not introducing you know, expensive and rare elements here. <clears throat> then we use only continuous flow processes. So this is a, a picture of a coder. We, we use continuous coding, continuous flow heat treatment to make the separator. There, there are processes that are used at scale in the battery and ceramics industries. So the combination of low cost materials and low cost continuous processing we hope can make uh, cheap separators. So what that would translate to in terms of costs, uh, we've done you know, pretty extensive cost modeling relative to traditional lithium ion. We hope to eliminate you know, roughly 17% of the cost by these benefits that I've described previously. And so of course, lithium ion isn't standing still. They're gonna be reducing cost as they get to higher economies of scale, uh, larger factory footprints, uh, better supply chains. And many of these benefits we hope to capture as well. You know, if there's anything that relates to cathode, we can benefit from that as well. Uh, on the cell assembly and manufacturing side, a lot of those improvements will translate to our cell as well. So as lithium ion comes down a cost curve, we hope that we can ride down a, a parallel but lower cost curve because we've, again, eliminated the anode. Um, so I think that is all a, hopefully a pretty compelling technology. We're not done yet, of course. We're not selling these cells. So what have we got left to do? Uh, these are the, the three key remaining tasks that we're gonna be working on. Improving our separator process. So we need to improve the quality and consistency of the separator manufacturing process, and then the throughput as well. And then as I discussed, uh, as we increase the throughput, that'll enable us to increase the layer count in multi-layer cells. We're aiming to target the, the dozens of layers for automotive cells and then go into further ramping and improving volume manufacturing processes in a, a pilot line. So that'll, that'll happen in several chunks. Today we're doing engineering in, in a, uh, basically a scaled up R&D lab in San Jose, <clears throat> about 80,000 square feet that we've been using to develop prototypes. We have secured a larger nearby building that's 200,000 square feet. We're currently installing the dry rooms here and we'll be installing tools. We hope to move in by the end of the year here. This is what we would use as our, our pilot facility where we'll be producing on the orders of, call it 100,000 cells, where we can use mass market or, or mass manufacturing equipment to produce prototypes for customers and then scale into mass manufacturing after that. So to put this in a time axis, these are some of the key milestones that we set out for ourselves uh, publicly last year to secure that uh, what we're calling the QS0, or Quantum Escape Pilot Line facility. 
Um, we met a, a Volkswagen technical milestone that involved uh, them sampling our, our cells early, earlier this year. Uh, still working on the, the four layer, and eight to 10 layer cells that we're targeting by the end of the year. Um, but we are showing really good progress there that shows I think we're on track. The next year, uh, do more customer prototype sampling and really move in, install all the tools into our pilot line. Uh, in 2023, use that pilot line to produce a lot of samples that our partners can use and test cars, and then to ramp up into commercialization after that. So I, I don't want to minimize the challenges in front of us. There's gonna be a lot of challenges in the manufacturing process you know, that said, I think we have overcome a lot of the, the key chemistry and materials challenges to get to this point. So I'll, I also don't want to minimize what we've done so far, but there's going to be a lot of challenges going forward. So if these are the kinds of challenges that excite you, I'd, I'd invite you, please come. We're, we're hiring really aggressively. We've, we've added, you know, uh, we've, we've basically doubled this, the company size since coronavirus which that in itself has been an interesting journey um, to, to go while we've had to be mostly remote. Um, but we're, we're continuing to grow. We have over 100 job openings currently posted on our website across a full range of, of technical and even non-technical roles. Uh, and this is a picture inside one of our uh, many dry rooms here showing you know, it's packed with equipment and we need the people to come in and run this equipment. So if this is the kind of thing that interests you, please do go to quantumscape.com and look at our careers page. Um, we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, so this is, this is the, the talk. I'm happy to take questions from the audience. Tim, uh, thank you very much for uh, overview talk, uh, what's happening in uh, QuantumScape. Um, there are really large number of questions flowing in. As you can see, people are excited about uh, learning about QuantumScape. Uh, well, if you don't mind, let me start by asking one question just to uh, warm up. Um, so team, um, I'm glad to see the progress in QuantumScape. Um, so we'll have some questions you know, starting from the first one, maybe touch upon the uh, the know-how, the, uh, the, the, the secret in quantum scale, feel free to <laughs> not to answer directly. Uh, um, so the first question is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people working on solid state batteries, university lab, national lab, startup companies, everybody talk about it. Um, there are three major class of uh, solid electrolyte, whether it's solid state polymer, whether it's a ceramics of uh, oxide or sulfide. Uh, can you disclose what the electrolyte quantumscape is using mm -hmm. in terms of composition or roughly the, uh, what category is it in? I think everybody's wondering about that. So I'll just ask this question for everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Um, so what we've said is that it's a, a fully dense, 100% ceramic material. We haven't disclosed its composition, but, but what I can say is that throughout our, throughout our many years of development, we tried and tested a lot of, lot of different separator materials. So not only did we you know, read all the papers, but we got intimately familiar with all of the common materials from you know, oxides, sulfides, polymers, gels, borohydrides, halides, you, know, you name it, basically we tested it. Um, perovskites, antiperovskites, everything. You know, we've got pretty intimate hands-on experience. So we're, we're familiar with all the challenges. Um, so in the, the slide where I sort of laid out a lot of the, the key challenges of separators, um, this was not just, you know, from a study of reading a lot of journals, but we did theoretical studies, DFT simulations, and a lot of experiments to understand all the, the challenges. Um, so yeah, it, unfortunately, I can't reveal our composition because that is kind of the secret sauce, but um, you know, we're, we're familiar with, with all the challenges here. And I think it takes a, a pretty deep level of understanding to arrive at the right chemistry and, and then furthermore, the right process of how do you produce it. So team, uh, is there a plan when you could disclose this? <laughs> the reason <laughs> to ask is uh, I, I find out all the companies, so I want to convince other people their technology is working. They will need to tell people to build up that confidence and say, well, this is working because of we used A, B, C, and D. 
So I understand, you know, this confidential information, it needs to keep, for, keep it for a while. But at some point, this probably will, will all needs to come out to uh, provide a convincing, uh, you know, chemistry, uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, why it's working, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. I mean, in terms of um, people we need to convince, I think our customers are, are number one. We, we really need to convince our customers that the technology works. So to do that, we, we provide samples to the customers that they can test in their labs. Um, and you know, most of those haven't been announced, but Volkswagen has issued several press releases that they've tested mm -hmm. our cells and they, they work according to all the expectations and automotive requirements that, that they were uh, supposed to. Um, so I think that the, the proof really is in the pudding. Um, you know, if I told you our separator technology is X, I don't think that would be a compelling proof that it works because like I said, none of these have been demonstrated to work. Um, so I think that the proof is really in, in the cell data that, that I revealed to you. Um, in terms of revealing the, the technology, you know, maybe at some point after a commercial launch, when the cells are available, you know, at that point, I, I might expect our competitors to acquire some of the cells and, and take them apart and reverse engineer them. So at some point, the, the cat will be out of the bag. and We might, you know, at, at that point, be free to talk about it. But I think it's still several years till we get there. So I wouldn't want to sacrifice this several year, hopefully, head start that we've got here. You know, our, our investors have uh, invested money on the premise that they're going to hopefully be able to make some money here. Uh, so by giving away our head start, we would be not doing our, our fiduciary obligation toward our investors. Yeah. Uh, Will, I pass uh, to you. Thank you, Ian. Tim, again, congratulations on all the outstanding progress. I'm, I'm, it's really amazing to watch the progress, even just over the past few months as you release more and more results. And thank you for getting into quite a bit of the technical details. I think uh, many of our uh, listeners are scientists and engineers, uh, both in academia and industry. So it's greatly appreciated. Um, I was going to ask you a high level question, but I want to maybe piggyback off what he asked. Um, when you say you're examining all of the possible solid electrolyte, whether it's in academic publications and, and your own innovations, how much optimization goes into a particular chemistry before you say it's not gonna work? I imagine it's not just as simple as, oh, here's the recipe, we try it. And it, it's, it's a no-go because you're also very um, concerned about false negatives, right? Can you speak to about how much care and attention and, and resources it takes to qualify a material and say, it's not gonna work? Yeah, that's a great question, thanks. Um, I think you can never prove that it doesn't work. There's always some things that you haven't tried. Um, so, you know, the first probably five years of the company was this period where we, we fanned out and explored very broadly all the materials that, that we were familiar had been published and, and then a lot of the more obscure ones as well. Um, and like I said, you can, I don't think you can ever prove that it's impossible, but you can get familiar enough to understand, well, this is not low hanging fruit. And then it's only by weighing alternatives against each other that you can say, well, which are the more promising alternatives that you ought to, ought to be spending your time on. Great, Tim. And maybe to that point, the, the winners that you have picked to pursue is, is the difference relative to the second place and the third place material evidence so big that the, the error bar just doesn't matter. So that the certainty is, 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 is absolute. Mm. Or were you making decision between you know, three top contenders? Um, you know, coming from more of a statistics background, which I think Tim, you, you highly appreciate, just to so how tough was that decision at the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for pushing me on that. Um, good follow up. So, you know, I think there are some that are pretty easy calls. Um, like, for example, it, it's my personal opinion that do, using a liquid with lithium metal is a very risky proposition. You know, I, I went back and looked at the Mali Energy experience and, and just said, boy, can we really trust a liquid uh, and a porous separator to withstand? dendrites across the full range of operating conditions that we're not going to know ahead of time. Um, so some of them, you know, we, we had 
gut calls uh, with with a more theoretical argument like that. Um, of course, I'm I'm very aware that many people are still pursuing liquids, and, and I wish them the best of luck. There, there's exciting developments there, but boy, I, I don't know that I would get a car that used lithium metal with a liquid electrolyte. Um, and then others, you know, we had a more experimental basis for the decision, where, you know, I like I said, I can't prove that something's not going to work. So I think Samsung's got a, a pretty interesting paper from last year using sulfides, where they had to apply very high temperatures and pressures. But I, I couldn't say that their technology couldn't be made to work in the long run. Um, so it, you know, at the end, when we had winnowed down our our material set to to the last two, it took maybe a year or two for us to finally lock down on one of those. And uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll still be wrong. <laughs> maybe there's something better out there that that I just don't know. So at the end, you you have to make a judgment call in the absence of data because you can never get all of the data you need. And you know, lots of leaders from from uh, Jeff Immelt to Steve Jobs would say that. At some point, you just have to make a decision because you can't let uh, perfection stand in the way of progress. If you make a decision, you can make progress. And yeah, maybe it won't be perfect. Maybe you'll have to go and revisit your decision at some point. But without making a decision, you can't make progress. So at some point, you just have to say, all right, we're never going to have all the data. Let's use all the data we have to make our best judgment. Tim, thanks so much for the insight on your innovation philosophy. It's, um, it's really wonderful to see it. Uh, e? Yeah, um, so team, uh, so let's uh, look at the uh, quantum scale so cell uh, uh, geometry, right? So it's very interesting to, uh, to see you go down to the path of NO3. Um, you save the cost of producing NO. You have your uh, uh, ceramic separator. So then what about cathode? Now, if it's all, I assume it's all solid state no liquid in there. Then, um, so the cathode side uh, require ion conduction as well. So looks like if that's the case, uh, the traditional cathode will not work well unless you also blend it in ion conducting solid state materials with the cathode. So can you mention a little bit, talk a little bit about the cathode uh, how could you enable solid state? I know just many startup company put in liquid electrolyte and end on the cathode mm -hmm. part because that also requires ion conduction. Yeah, it would be good to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, let, me, let me clarify here. So all of the results that I showed you today are using an organic catholyte here. It's, it's not an inorganic solid material. Uh, they're organics that are a combination of uh, a liquid and polymer. So that said, we do have programs on three different uh, ion conducting additives in the, the cathode. We have programs in, in liquids, gels, and solid state here to enable full solid state. Um, all three have their own unique challenges, which is why we're still pursuing all three in parallel. But the, uh, the data that I showed you today use uh, an organic material in the cathode. Okay. So yeah, that's that's interesting. Indeed, this com comes back to the um, uh, all the challenges. So academia talk about. So the industry are very well aware of is what well, the interface, the NO, uh, lithium metal solid state interface, and cathode and um, solid electrolyte interface. So um, this um, volume change, structure change, the interface will not be stable. Would be good to hear your thoughts about these uh, these problems because you guys made a lot of progress. Maybe you understanding get to next level. If you could share a little bit on that, yeah, 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 excellent point. So uh, the bulk is relatively much more simple and straightforward than the interfaces. So we have spent a long time studying all of all of those key interfaces: separator to anode, separator to cathode, and and cathode to catholite material all of these interfaces are, are really critical to understand. So we've built quite a, an impressive set, I would have to say, of material science capabilities inside the company. You know, I walk around the Stanford material science department and we've got basically all those tools and, and sometimes more, um, you know, FIBs and SEMs and XPS and XRF and 
you know, just all across the board, we've had to do a lot of studying of the reactions that can occur at the interfaces. Um, you know, one, one thing that, to emphasize this uh, anode to separator interface is a pretty key one because it's a low surface area interface. So if you look at a lithium ion cell, <clears throat> the graphite to ion conductor interface is, is large because you have a lot of graphite particles. So there's maybe roughly a factor of 20 in terms of surface area between a, a graphite anode or hosted anode and just the geometric mm -hmm. interface, interfacial area. So that mean, means all else being equal, you need to have 20 times lower ASR area specific resistance at this interface to enable the same power density. That's, that's definitely a challenge. You need to um, have, have some good engineering of, of that interface in particular to enable high rates. Um, but then really every interface is critical when it comes to cycling, when it comes to calendar life of the cell. Um, you can't have massive side reactions at any of these interfaces. Uh, thanks, Tim. Well, back to you. All right. Um, we have a lot of questions. I think this is the most number of questions we have seen since uh, Stan Wintingham's uh, inaugural talk with us. So I'm still trying to group them because uh, I don't think I can ask you 40 questions. <laughs> <laughs> But before I do that, um, let me just want to ask my high level question, which is the following. Um, I really like the slide you show at the end um, on the manufacturing process, on the bottlenecks and so forth. There have been many fields um, historically that worked with thin film ceramics um, and the thin film glasses for that matter. There is a huge amount of learnings there. When, when you look at that body of work, that body of um, industry experience, how much of that can you draw from um, when you start to scale up, you know, making tens or hundreds of millions of these separator membranes? Um, and what kind of um, challenges do you see from these results? Uh, there's anything that gives you a pause in terms of, okay, maybe this will require uh, further engineering, uh, just the learnings through adjacent fields. Yeah, yeah, good, good topic of discussion here. So we've spent probably the last six years uh, almost exclusively focused on processing. You know, the, I think big chunks of company history were roughly five years to pick a materials and system and architecture. And then since then, we've really been focused on the process. So it's very complicated, a lot of subtleties, a lot of interactions up and down the process flow, you know, something way up the line can have these unexpected consequences down the line. So there's been a lot of process engineering and it's also an area that's made especially difficult because I would say there's, there's relatively less academic or theoretical understanding of what happens inside a processing chamber uh, relative to once you have a material, you know, how does it perform? Um, so it's had to be mostly empirical um, where you, know, you just do a lot of big DOEs and you get subtle signals and sometimes you get those wrong, so you have to go back and revisit them. Um, we have, of course, hired a, lo a lot of expertise from adjacent industries. We've read what's available, but then you, you, ha you just have to do a lot of experimentation as well. Um, so I know that there, there are some like uh, Professor Rupp, who you had on in a recent seminar, who are now studying from an academic perspective, different processing techniques. And I think that's a really rich field of, of further inquiry. So I know that a lot of academics tune into this discussion. I would, I would highly encourage more academic focus, I think, on processing. Um, you know, there's one of the things that makes this hard is there's no debugger for atoms. If you're uh, writing a piece of software code, you can run it in debugging mode and step through line by line of the code and see where things go wrong. But in a, inside a process chamber, you can't do that. You can't watch where all the atoms are going and step through you know, atom by atom as, as something happens and, and see where it goes wrong. You just, you know, you put something in to a, a process chamber. It's almost like a black box. You can take a few uh, average measurements like pressure and temperature inside the, the chamber. Um, but you're, you're really almost flying blind and you get something out at the end and then you have to, use you know, XPS or something like that to test it and XRD to figure out what you just made. But if you could uh, open up that black box and make it more of a white box with a lot more understanding, I think that's a 
really uh, obviously a very challenging field, but also really promising and important one. Great, Tim. If I can follow up just very briefly, um, you know, the, the one example that comes to mind that has, you know, these thin membranes uh, is, um, you know, something like solid oxide fuel cell membranes. Uh, how, in comparison to that processing, is it much more demanding uh, for um, quantum, spa uh, quantum scapes technology or, or how is it similar? Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of the processing difficulties here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Fuel cells are, are one of the closer analogs as is the field of multi-layer ceramic capacitors, MLCCs. So we have drawn inspiration and, and processing techniques and equipment from those fields. Uh, so fuel cells are typically making thicker membranes than we make, right? You make, and they make an anode supported or cathode supported or electrolyte supported uh, fuel cell, which at the end of the day, turns out to often be um, hundreds of microns to even millimeters thick. Um, in a battery, I, I don't think that'll work. Our current densities are lower. Um, we, we use thinner layers for anode, cathode, and separator. So one of the, the key challenges relative to fuel cells is making much thinner materials. And then another one is um, if you take something like YSE, for example, a very common fuel cell, solid oxide fuel cell membrane, it's relatively inert compared to um, most separator materials that, you know, to conduct lithium, you have to contain lithium and lithium is pretty volatile. So working with lithium containing materials is, is in many ways more challenging than working with the more inert materials like YSC. Uh, and then MLCCs is the other industry I mentioned. They make super thin ceramic materials that can often be, you know, a micron or so in, in thickness, even less for the ceramic components. So that, that's a very interesting technology. However, on the other side, they're usually very small. You know, if you know MLCCs, they're often the size of a grain of sand, something very small. Um, it's, it's a big and growing field, right? A recent iPhone has over a thousand MLCCs in it. Electric cars might have tens of thousands uh, or over 10,000 MLCCs. So it's a field where there has been a lot of technology development and processing and manufacturing know-how but again, much smaller devices than we need to make in a battery. But I think drawing from these two fields, as well as battery manufacturing, you know, we, we want to use to the extent possible tools and processes that are known in the battery industry. Um, so those have been the key sources of inspiration. Very exciting. Thank you, Tim. So maybe e, we should dive into um, some of the technical questions from the audience, I think. Yeah. There's so many. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Um, well, maybe I'll take the uh, first one. So team, uh, this is from uh, our friend, uh, a solid state battery expert, Jürgen Janet from Germany. Um, he asks, um, you go from 3.4 bar to one bar the pressure, right? This, um, as, um, is, is this step difficult? How, what's the challenge right there? Just <laughs> from the number, <laughs> you make it easy during your presentation, I, I bet. <laughs> so what, what's the challenge right there? You know, go, go from 3.4 to one bar. Yeah, uh, this was definitely not easy. It, it has taken, you know, a team of ours uh, probably a couple of years to get to the point where we could demonstrate this. It's, it's not easy, right? Um, so some of the key steps along the way were interfaces, as we discussed earlier. If interfaces are high resistance, then, um, then you're not going to be able to cycle at these rates. And then if anything develops throughout cycling, um, any separation of the interfaces, for example, then you, you just wouldn't be able to see performance like this at, um, at just the one atmosphere absolute pressure. So interfaces were a, a key area of focus. And then the cell construction as well. So on top of just what materials do you use um, to, you know, this, this one atmosphere of room pressure basically that gets applied to the outside of the pouch, you wanna use as much of that as possible. Um, so figuring out how to, to uh, to use that ambient pressure on the active materials um, was, was a little bit of cell engineering that has to be figured out. Yeah. Well, back to you. Sure. And uh, Tim, just as he said, um, you know, these are questions from our audience. So if you're 
not able to answer them, please feel free not to do so. And don't kill the messenger either. And, <laughs> uh, so I thought I'll start with um, uh, something that you mentioned, um, which is the formation time for the solid state cells can be a lot shorter than lithium. And certainly, you know, if anyone's been to a, a battery uh, cell plant, they know that the formation takes a lot of footprint at the factory. Um, I was going to ask the opposite question is, have you found increasing the formation time to have some benefit for solid state? Or there's just no benefit at all of having any formation? Yeah, yeah, it's a gr great question. Um, you know, I think Tesla in their battery day said that they're trying to make a lot of improvements to the formation process because, like you said, it takes a, a huge amount of space and a lot of capital. Um, so, in terms of reducing formation, I think, you know, one thing that you probably can't get away from in high volume manufacturing is, is some ability to bend the cells. Um, you're going to end up taking each cell and then stacking them in parallel and in series configurations. And you want all of the cells that are in these similar groups and strings to have near the same impedance and near the same capacity. So you probably need to at least do a test that enables you to, to qualify the cell in terms of its impedance and capacity. Uh, to be able to, to bin them and, and group them with other similar cells. Um, whether you could do that with less than one complete charge is a really interesting question. There's probably, you know, I, your own lab has published some machine learning approaches to making the most out of a little bit of data. So, you know, what could, you could speculate that, you know, run, run uh, an extremely short pulse of current through the cell, and then see if you can get all the information that you can out of that. Um, you could even speculate of doing EIS or something that, that int introduces some frequency dependent response and try and use that information to fully characterize the cell. Uh, I would say that there's, there's probably some papers in there because I don't think that's a solved technology yet, but I think that would be the dream of as short of formation uh, cycle as possible. Thanks, Tim. And certainly, I think uh, any advance in speed information for, for conventional lithium ion batteries should be partially transferable um, to the solid state. So I think that will be an exciting synergy. Uh, let me ask another one before handing back to E. This is a big one. Um, what can you tell us about your first cycle irreversibility? I noticed that you normalized it um, to the maximum energy. Um, of the cell, um, uh, you know, for, for the audience, you have to carry these extra lithium uh, in the cathode, right, which adds cost and weight. Um, is this something you're able to comment on, Tim? Uh, yeah. So just for clarity, I did take out the formation cycle on these charts. So the, the formation cycle would, would, we usually run at slightly lower than 1C rates. So you'd get a little bit more capacity and then it would make the, the whole uh, thing shift down a little bit. But that's, you know, that's typically you would bin a cell's capacity and name its nominal capacity, not off of the formation cycle, but after something just post that first cycle. Uh, our first cycle looks much like, um, much like anyone else would find in their labs. They, we use a similar NMC to what's in commercial lithium ion. So as many people know, there is a first cycle columbic inefficiency from that first cycle that would have Know, between five and 10% excess lithium in that uh, first cycle. Now that excess lithium in a lithium ion cell is really useful because it'll go into forming the SEI. And in our system, we're not forming that SEI. So that there's just a little bit of excess lithium. It doesn't add any additional cost because that all just comes along with the NMC that's synthesized. Yeah, Tim, just to clarify, so, so you have some irreversibility but you're saying it's not going to the SCI, so where does it go? Yeah, it's just from the cathode material. So just as, as any other uh, person who, who you know, buys an NMC or even makes it and lithiates it would find that there's some lithium that you can't put back into the NMC at the same rate that you take it out. Um, that, that'll happen in our cathode as well. And so then that lithium on the first charge will plate onto the anode side. 
Got it. So you're saying, Tim, that all the irreversibility comes from the irreversible capacity or the pseudo irreversible capacity loss in the cathode, the cathode. and none from the anode. So your overall irreversibility is smaller than a conventional lithium ion battery. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. So we have tried to measure coulombic inefficiency of, of our cells, and it's it's actually very difficult to measure because we're into the the many nines where you know a typical cycler is not accurate enough to measure it. Um, but you you know a, a slide like this I think is is pretty sufficient to demonstrate very high coulombic efficiency, right? We add zero excess lithium to the cell, and you can get to over 1,400 cycles to to north of 80 percent. So you could translate this back into a capacity retention metric and it's it's something like 99.99 something percent um, of, of capacity retention cycle to cycle. And that's almost exactly the Coulombic efficiency of the cell. Um, although, the, like I said, the Coulombic efficiency is hard to measure because it's so good. Great, Tim. Thanks. It's very exciting to hear. E, back to you. Yeah, Tim. Um... I want to come back to this question, but in a different way. Well, we were asked previously about the scaling, right? You know, you touch upon in your talk, the materials you need to make a, a, a sufficient amount to go to the next level. But I want to touch upon that uh, in a, you know, different, different perspective. It's about a year. Um, and, uh, and when you scale, this a lateral size become bigger for maybe uh, coupon size, corn cell size to bigger and bigger, you know, I understand eventually you, you, you are going to settle on one of the size. Uh, uh, you, you feel like that's, that's the best in terms of performance and scale up. So this lateral size right there. Um, and we you know solid state, you made a single layer and then go to multi-layer or solid state, then the, this price is going in. So do you, can you mention something about the yield? You know, and there's a lot of people working on solid state will know, um, you know, you know, once you have solid state, you press it a little bit, easy to crack and, and the yield goes down. If you go to large area, it's even harder. And you go to multi-layer, it will be even harder. This is scale in a sense is in final year will be impacted, right? So it would be great to see your comment on, 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 the, on the question of the yield and when you do scale up, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So this is why that we, we sort of emphasize that a lot of our results were on this commercially relevant form factor here. <clears throat> um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. We went through several steps of scale from these sort of coin size cells to, to this intermediate form factor. Mm -hmm. right? I showed one result that was 30 by 30 millimeters to this, what we call a commercially relevant size. <clears throat> um, various automakers might have, you know, slightly different preferred sizes depending on what capacity they want for each cell and how they handle safety uh, and thermals of the cell. But, but I do think this is a commercially relevant size. When we make you know, several dozen layers here, it would, would have a capacity larger than a, a 2170 cell, um, larger than a 4680, I believe. So it's still a, you know, a healthy sized cell. Um, one of the trends in the industry is going to larger and larger cells, I think at, at least, um, so not only is Tesla on the spectrum of 18650 to 2170 and 4680, but Volkswagen has announced their platform of quite large cells. GM has announced they're trying to go to large cells. The BYD blade is, is quite large. Um, I think in the, in the fullness of time, we could probably make cells that are quite large. Um, there are trade-offs when you make cells large. So yield that you mentioned is one of the trade-offs, but that's something that we'll be continuing to, to strive to improve. Um, other trade-offs would be safety of cell propagation events. So the bigger your cell is, um, the more risk there is of if there is a safety event in the cell that it could release enough energy to then propagate to adjacent cells. Um, and another trade-off is the sort of modularity that you would be able to achieve. A bigger cell is gonna have fewer ways to stack in series and parallel to achieve the different sort of uh, energy targets. So if you're trying to, you know, many of the car makers are trying to get one battery to address a lot of their fleet so that they can benefit from the economies of scale of the battery. But then it means that they'll be locked into sort of a few discrete quanta of pack sizes. 
in terms of kilowatt hours. So that's another one of the drawbacks to larger cells. And then another one I could mention is thermals. So as the cell gets larger and larger, the more likely it is to have some thermal gradients across the cell, which then results in impedance differences laterally in the cell, um, which could result in some parts of the cell being cycled harder than others. So there are a lot of trade-offs when you're talking about cell size. I think we picked a, a pretty good sweet spot where when we make several dozen layers here as we're targeting, it'll have a, a good energy density where there's enough energy to drown out the packaging contributions. So I think it makes for a pretty good initial launch. So this is the form factor that we are planning for the, the first um, automotive prototypes. But then like we said, over time, it make larger cells. Thanks, Tim. Well, back to you. All right, Tim, here's another um, direct technical question. And thank you for all of your direct answers. Really appreciate it. Um, you showed a lot of results on Cycle Life, and, and many of them are at relatively high rates. Um, can you also comment on the calendar aging um, for solid state cells? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so I did show some Cycle Life out to, to many cycles at C by three. So those, those take a long time, right? Uh, I think, let's see, to do the quick math, you get, what, about four cycles a day at, at C by three. So when you get out to a thousand cycles, that's 250 days, you know, just to do the rough math. So it's, it's not a short period of time. That's another thing that makes battery development slow, as, as you know, from your you know, machine learning and accelerated life testing. Um, so we haven't released any other calendar life data other than to show that the fade can be quite gradual over these extended cycling durations. Thank you, Tim. And just um, to calibrate our audience as well, um, can you just tell us the, the expectation for calendar life for say consumer electronics versus EV applications? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, you know, lithium ion cells are, are quite impressive. Um, so there is there is little calendar life fade in a lithium ion cell. Um, you know, the expectation is to, over the life of the cell for the impedance to grow maybe by 50 to 100%. And the life of the cell is expected to be anywhere between eight and, and 12 years. So to get, call it 50 to 100% impedance growth in eight to 12 years, that's, that's a tall order. Um, the best lithium ion cells can pretty much do that today. And Tim, am I correct to say if you extrapolate what you have, for example, in your first cycle per day experiment, it is still um, fall uh, a bit below that, right? Quite a bit below that in the calendar life. Uh, well, we, we, uh, we haven't commented on the calendar life of ourselves yet, so I can't address that. I see. All right, we'll try to estimate it from the, the C over three test. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe let me just ask one related technical question. One thing that um, struck me as quite interesting is you report 100% depth of discharge. Uh, just from a more scientific engineering sense, can you tell us what that means? Are you removing all of the lithium uh, from the negative side? Uh, so okay. that you are replating fresh lithium from scratch um, every single full DLB cycle, or do you mean something else? Yeah, so I, I think the typical definition, or at least the one we use, it, uh, is between voltage limits. So mm. you usually define your lower voltage cutoff and your upper voltage cutoff and cycle between those. And so that's how we do, when we do 100% depth of discharge, we mean all the way from the lowest cutoff voltage to the upper, upper cutoff voltage. That would be, you know, uh, that when we report a cathode loading, that's the cathode loading that we observe cycling between those voltage ranges. So it's not like we're, you know, cycling between 3.8 and 3.9 and calling that 100% depth of discharge. It's depth of discharge is the voltage that gets you this uh, capacity from the cathode. Got it. So you always, uh, you're saving a little bit of lithium per cycle, I presume then, uh, on the negative side. By this um, yeah, I think the, the lithium goes where it will. <laughs> we control current and voltage and, and the lithium goes where it wants to. Thank you. Yeah, Eve, and, and maybe we have to stop the Inquisition now. <laughs> Tim has been so uh, generous with uh, his uh, insights and comments. Uh, Tim, yeah. maybe we should let you ask us some questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, the first, first question I'd like to ask is, you know, have you seen anything else that, that uh, 
you know, I guess we've missed when we lay out the competitive landscape. Is there anything else out there that that um, is coming close to the results that we've demonstrated? Yeah, I think uh, Tim, you gave a very nice uh, typical examples in each category. And I think that's a, a quite a fair analysis and what's what's happening in the in the world. Yeah. Um, and uh, certainly it's, uh, it's a problem require academia, national lab and the industry all, all working very hard towards, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, let me echo that as well. And, um, you know, I think QuantumScape and your team in particular has, you know, setting a really high bar for disclosing data. Although, you know, many people say more data should be disclosed, but you have disclosed the most. And what I really appreciate is um, QuantumScape is sharing its, you know, best data with the world. And, you know, I, I think sometimes the comparison can be a little bit biased because, you know, QuantumScape is such a leader in sharing great results and others are sharing them with a slightly different goal in mind. So I think maybe this is also a, a call to everybody to, to share data more openly and their best performing data so we can really make comparisons across the board. But you know, I think you're really doing something really fantastic here to put the best best results for, not necessarily just well. Here, some result will publish in an academic journal. Um, mm -hmm. That 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 may not make the comparison. So I also think that the table, to some extent, um, um, is a reflection of your willingness to share the best results. And uh, we'll be curious to see um, how better comparison can be made in the future when everybody starts sharing their best results as well. Um, but I think uh, quantum skip is definitely uh, playing a very important leadership role here. Yeah, well, thanks. We, you that. know, the, re the reason we do this is we get questions all the time from our investors. Okay, how do you guys compare to X or what do you think of Y announcement that was just made? So we were, we're trying to assemble the best kind of apples to apples comparison that we could. And you're, you're right, uh, there isn't really a, a standard of you know, I get this many teraflops or, or something. There's, there's not really a standard test that everybody uses benchmark here. So we are just trying to compare what is published relative to automotive requirements. And then we do try and also put on all the slides of our test results, you know, a pretty complete description of the test conditions here so that we're, you know, it's not like we make a power cell for the power test and an energy cell for the energy test and a life cell for the life test. It's it's all the, the same architecture. Tim, I may have missed it, but I don't think I saw volumetric and uh, graphometric energy density at the cell level uh, in the table. I, I'm, I'm guessing it's not reported um, at all um, in the other findings, I think. Yeah, what, what we share is our target for the cell level here. <clears throat> These we're, we're targeting areas in here for a commercial launch. Um, when we make a one layer cell or even a four or 10 layer cell, the packaging uh, is still a large fraction of the mass and volume of the cell. So the energy density of a one or even 10 layer cell is nothing to write home about it, is not good. But our cell architecture and materials, we believe are, are compatible with these targets. And that's what we're aiming for once we get up to the dozens of layers. Great, thank you for the question. You, question. Other questions? Okay, first? yeah. Um, the other was, I guess, question or maybe favor. Uh, to everybody on this call, um, I think the call to action that, that I'm requesting here is send us your best students, your best researchers, or, or come yourself. Uh, like I said, we're hiring a lot. There are a lot of challenges in front of us as we scale up to manufacturing. But it is, I think, a globally important problem to, to solve this getting uh, better batteries, not just for the automotive market and enable the transformation of the automotive market to electrification, which which is happening, but also on the grid scale side as well. Um, it's an equally large market, equally important to climate change. There's a lot of emissions, of course, just that, that derive from electricity generation. And to get to high levels of penetration of solar and wind and renewables, you need to have energy storage. So it's a globally important problem. And I think we've got a, a pretty interesting solution that we're working on. So I'd love to have all the best and brightest Tim, yeah. I would be very surprised if you don't get several job applications after this seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, I think team, I think for the time consideration, 
uh, maybe we should uh, close today's event. Where do you want to uh, announce? Yeah, maybe, maybe let me ask one final high level question. How about that, Tim? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we'll really uh, enjoy this. <laughs> we, won't, we won't let you go. I, <laughs> oh, great. I enjoy we're it too. Learning, we're learning so much. Um, Tim, this is a question, an honest question from E and I and all the academics, I think, listening. What, you know, you have shown tremendous progress. Uh, when focus, uh, working in a very disciplined manner, uh, working in the high resource level of industry, working on one problem. What can we academics do to support this in the meantime? And certainly over the past 10 years, there's been a lot of academic interest in solid state batteries of all varieties. Of course, we train great students and great people, as you just mentioned. But in terms of fundamental insights and innovation, what would be your recommendation to academia what's if you already said focus on processing but what other recommendation can you make what do you find valuable what can we do to help yeah yeah the, the focus on processing is one um uh training great students as you mentioned of, of course a, a huge contribution um you know the i think the role of academia to generate fundamental insights into mechanisms uh and discovering new materials is is really a great role to play so um at, at the end of the day, I think most technological challenges will boil down to a material science problem. You know, if you had a better material, you could make something lighter and cheaper and stronger. Um, so understanding the fundamentals is, is a super valuable contribution. And we do read papers. Uh, one of the things I wasn't really in touch with as a grad student is how many people in industry and around the world do read papers. I thought, you know, maybe publish a paper and it sits on a shelf in a library and nobody reads it but um, we, we do read papers so don't don't be discouraged about that um, you know one other contribution that could be made I think is something I've talked with you a lot about will is in more statistics so I went through undergrad master's PhD postdoc at Stanford all without any exposure to st statistics which as I now see things uh, was a crime <laughs> um, when you, especially when you're doing industrial R&D, but I think even academic R&D, you should really try and quantify what is the certainty around your result. And uh, statistics is the, the toolbox of how to quantify certainty or quantify uncertainty, which is so important when it comes to making the ju required judgment calls about what you should work on, is how certain are you about the data that you have. So papers that get published with one sample are, um, you know, it, a little bit less trustworthy than papers that get published with more samples. So that's another reason why we always try and show multiple samples on our charts to show that it's not just an outlier that, that can't be reproduced. Um, yeah, since yeah. Uh, we'll ask, we'll kind of add a little bit based on your question. So, so Tim, um, <clears throat> you know, this is uh, combining with my experience as well, right? Uh, I think what I could come back to this question, how academia can help. Um, I see oftentimes there's a topic area, like a new material is coming out. Once you publish that, everybody else sees it. They're going to put their effort into that and also study that material from other people's study. I mean, you, I, I just learned tremendously, you know, from my silicon anode, or lithium metal, everything. Basically everything, once you publish, there's always somebody else coming up different ideas and analyze that maybe deeper on, on, on a certain problem. That, come back to educate me. Uh, that might be something industry can think about utilizing, you know, uh, uh, national lab, university, academia, and, and, and really solve that problem. And, and then this exchange of uh, idea, the results in a published format can push the field forward. You look at all the battery material, you know, whether it's MMC, it's lithium ion phosphate, graphite, this will all involve in hundreds, if not thousands of research group, right? So, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the way uh, collective, uh, uh, I think intellectual <laughs> contribution really push the field forward. Yeah, I just added yeah. this a little bit, Will, if you don't mind, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and a, a focus on commercially relevant problems, I think is, is also beneficial. So I, I'm not saying that everything has to be very applied. It can still be theoretical, um, foundational, <clears throat> work, but on, I, th I think it, it really benefits to have a clear problem statement in mind of, 
you know, if I solve this, what impact is it going to have? A lot of us are, are in the engineering field. So of course, applications are paramount. But even in, in battery science, I see a tendency to branch out and study something new because maybe you can get a publication or, or um, distinguish, distinguish yourself in a small emerging field. But a lot of these fields, I see them as kind of commercial dead ends. Um, now, of course, that's my own opinion and everybody should <laughs> have their own opinion. Um, but I think that since you're asking me for ways to help industry, that would be one of my opinions is look at, you know, if I solve this problem, what impact would it have in a practical application? Okay. Well, Tim, this is, uh, these are really great and insightful comments. Um, and I really resonate with, uh, with all of them. And by the way, there is a course with your name on it. If you would like to give back to Stanford and come and teach, let me let me already really? propose a title. Maybe something like uh, "Living with Errors: uh, Coping with <laughs> Errors in Energy Technologies." Right? I think uh, <laughs> that would be a great way for you to give back to to uh, to your alma mater. And uh, we look forward to having you here a lecture, hopefully soon, uh, if you are time permits. Wow, that that's an honor. Thank you. Um, let's talk about that offline. Good. All right, Tim, um, we really appreciate all the time you've spent today, nearly two hours. Um, we learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience uh, is uh, digesting all the information you have shared. And, and thank, you be, thank you for being so forthcoming uh, in getting into all the technical details. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, so I would like to invite everyone uh, to visit our website um, at uh, energy.stanford.edu. We have just posted a few weeks ago all of the lecture recordings, uh, seminar recordings between March and June. Okay, so you can find this on our website and uh, most of the recordings are now posted on YouTube. Uh, please come and watch them and, and pause and, and take a look at the slides in great detail. Um, and, and I think this is gonna be a very useful resource uh, to many of you. Uh, and then just to, to remind you, um, to try to connect with us uh, and follow us on LinkedIn. Um, there are several additional student uh, and postdoc lab talks um, coming next week. Um, Natalie and, and Hua Xing uh, from Mike Tony and Zen and Baos groups will give talks on their, um, their uh, PhD work. And then finally, uh, for those of you who wish to gain broader exposure into energy topics, uh, we do have our professional education program so you can uh, visit online.stanford.edu slash energy uh, and take a, a, a multitude of courses, including energy storage um, and, and coming soon electric vehicles. Uh, so with that, let me close today's seminar and thank once again, uh, Tim for his generosity with this time and E for co-hosting. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>